the Overwatch developers went over to Reddit and they answered a bunch of questions in an AMA. And I guess the headline sort of info is, Roadhog is going to get nerfed. He's going to be nerfed today. If you're watching this video the day it went live, expect to see survivability nerfs. So expect things like uh, take a breather to get nerfed. Um, there's potential for some Sigma nerfs as well. Maybe that's going to be his ultimate. Stay tuned for more info. Uh, also, we've got information on Reaper's Shadow Step rework, Cassidy's Grenade rework. Again, apparently this is going to be turned into more of a flashbang. Possible Symmetra reworks on the table. It's like the list just goes on and on and on. And also, potentially, Mirror Watch abilities being added to future heroes or even hero reworks. Let's break all of this down, guys. I would grab a drink because this is going to be quite an in-depth video. Big shout out to Mangox over on Reddit for compiling the questions that the devs actually answered. All right, let's break all of this down. It's not related to Season 10 balance changes, but I'm going to ask anyway. Were we secretly testing any new upcoming heroes with the Mirror Watch event? And Blizz Alec, of course, the lead balance dev, responds with this. No secret testing of anything upcoming in the immediate. We do look at how some changes play out, though, when they become more real and get lots of games. I think the Bastion Ultimate in particular was quite fun, even if very loud and on the border technically. Reinhardt's Frenzy passive was also something we played around with internally, but it was quite hard to communicate effectively. It's also good to see what players get excited about when there are more wacky ideas, such as Mirror Watch or April Fools. Some of those could become real down the line. And I guess that's the, the takeaway here, guys, right? They're not going to become real, but they could in the future. I do actually like the, the comment about the Bastion Orc, because if you remember, Bastion basically spawned the little slices out of the ground. So wherever his artillery hit, the slices would come out of the ground. That was actually really cool, that was. And there's potential we might see some sort of pet hero, maybe, in the future. I think that would be really cool. And obviously, with Reinhardt's Frenzy passive, yeah, I mean, he just he got angrier as he swung his hammer and he started swinging it faster. I mean, that's that was awesome. But yeah, again, the issue is how do you communicate that? I guess maybe his hammer starts glowing or something, but there's a lot of visual effects in Overwatch anyway. So yeah, but good news, that is, and interesting nonetheless. Who is the hardest character to balance and tweak out of the three roles? And Josh Noah responds and says, probably Sombra due to the permanent invisibility restricting how deadly we can make her, but also because she is a hero that excels with strong team coordination. There are a handful of other heroes with performance stats that differ greatly from the broader community perception of them, and that can create difficulty in how we approach balancing them as well. So there you have it. Sombra is the hardest hero to balance. I know you guys mentioned two upcoming DPS hero reworks. Is there any news about how those reworks are progressing? Who they'll be for, I think people have a pretty decent idea, but official confirmation would be nice, and or when they might be arriving. Also, are there any other heroes under consideration for potential reworks? Alec responds with, The two upcoming updates that were mentioned were for Cassidy and Reaper. For Cassidy, we started some exploration pre-season 9 for his update, due to where he was at the time. This update was originally looking at multiple pieces of his kit. We saw the Season 9 changes largely benefit him, so the update has got a more focused on Magnetic Grenade and other quality of life updates, specifically to his ultimate. In Season 11, we are updating Magnetic Grenade. It will behave closer to old Flashbang, no magnetic homing to the target used in short range, and will slow hinder the target. We think that plays a lot better with his kit and removes some of the larger frustrations around Magnetic Grenade. More specifics on that soon. Right, let's just get stuck into this. Magnetic Grenade, it just sounds like they're reverting it to me. What, are, they just, are we just going back to Flashbang? Like, <laughs> how many changes has Cassidy had to his Flashbang or his Grenade? I mean, I guess we still call it Flashbang, don't we? Even though it's been Magnetic Grenade for a couple of years now. But yeah, so it looks like we're just going back to a Flashbang here. Now, it's going to hinder, it's going to slow targets. Yeah, it's flashbang isn't it well i guess the old flashbang kept you stationary didn't it you got a flashbang you know we all remember the flashbang and the hammer it was a uh, a tried and tested <laughs> let's say combo that literally anybody could pull off and absolutely everybody hated it um so yeah this is not a straight up stun it looks like but it's going to hinder and it's going to slow the target yeah it looks like we're going backwards with cassidy to be honest i would have preferred it if they went a bit more crazy with cassidy and gave him something that actually made sense for a cowboy to have you know something whip related maybe not an actual grenade i mean what cowboys run around with flashbangs anyway it makes no sense <laughs> anyway he goes on to talk about reaper for reaper we went fairly wide as well in the beginning but then started to focus closely on updating shadow step at the moment we have something we quite like but it's actually a large technical challenge and we are in the process of planning out the work 
slash seeing what's possible. In the meantime, we may buff Reaper in some non-tank buster ways as he lost a lot in the most recent update. Okay, so Reaper started out as a like a wide range and rework to most of his kit and now it's just like actually we don't think he's too bad but we still don't like shadow step so we're going to do something with shadow step so any reaper mains out there just yeah expect a change to shadow step at some point but there is going to be a minor buff to reaper in a non-tank buster way uh before that so yeah stay tuned for that what is the average rank of your play testers and what level of input do they have in deciding what changes are made to each balance patch and Hudson responds with, A huge part of our team culture revolves around playtesting from designers to Q&A and community management. Everyone has the opportunity to play what we're working on and give open, honest feedback. One of the advantages of this model is we get perspective from a wide range of player ranks from GM1 to Bronze 5. It's been a while since we've taken an official poll on average rank, but having wide samples helps prevent tunnel visioning on feedback from specific ranks. So yeah, this obviously is good. You know, you want a wider breadth of people actually you know giving you feedback on the updates because if everyone's just top 500 or everyone's gm or master or whatever then you're not getting the full breadth of the community because of course most people are above a gold and below essentially and so in in <laughs> i guess in a lot of ways you want to see what they're saying about the game more so than the higher ranked players problem is the higher ranked players generally are the more vocal ones um also they used to do a lot of this kind of testing and i can attest to this as well test 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 <laughs> um with content creators i don't think they do it anymore because there was a series of leaks um, or unless I'm just not involved in these tests anymore, which, you know, is, is a very strong possibility. Um, but yeah, they used to do tests quite often and uh, they don't seem to be doing that anymore. But yeah, they do test the game. Two part question here. Why the inconsistency with dev comments, explanations for balance changes? There have been many changes that have been questionable. Biggest defender was buffing Sojin in January when she was widely considered the best DPS. Do you remember that, guys? That was crazy. <laughs> They were shipped with zero explanation. Just to find these changes will help a lot with player perception and we could understand these discrepancies. I have to ask, what is going on with Symmetra? She was weak, then buffed, then immediately reverted, now silenced. Is she getting reworked? What data shows that she needed a nerf? She is super weak and hard to use on ladder, uncoordinated environment by nature, and was only played in OWCS for Mauga. Shouldn't nerfing Mauga have been enough? Alec responds with, we should do a better job about this, especially when it comes to getting the community's visibility on what we are seeing versus what the player base may seem to think is the best hero at any given time. These can differ regularly as certain heroes get power reputations weaker or stronger than reality at a given rank. They are hard to shake off. Thanks for feedback there. We will make sure we have something here, even if it's a simple change. Symmetra kept some of the buffs in the patch, but yes, we hear the feedback on whether her current power level is or on where her current power level is. We may have been a bit overreactive to the Mauga compositions popping up during that time frame. He was certainly overtuned, and yes, he absolutely was, but we want to be sure of it. For right now, we are in discussions about Symmetra and especially her frontline presence. Believe that's a piece of the kit we'd like to promote further, whether through her survivability or beam damage. Yeah, so, you know, once again, Symmetra <laughs> is going to get looked at and definitely she does need looking at. And, uh, you know, I guess we're going to have to wait and see what they do with that. Um, but also the other note on, I guess, the issue with, <laughs> like, they do, they've done this over the years. I mean, like, I've covered this game now for like nine on seven years. And when I read statements software, it's like, well, you know, we need to do better on what we're seeing versus what the community player base may seem to think, you know. It, I don't want to say it's derogatory because that is a bit extreme. It's not a derogatory comment, but it is, again, it's one of those Blizzard comments, right? Well, we see the real world, you guys don't, so get lost kind of thing. But then if they're not going to explain why and what they see when they make changes, then it's only going to make the community even more confused. So in a way, it always comes back to Blizzard. So yeah, just blame Blizzard. <laughs> why was Smurf detection essentially removed from MMR adjustment, especially for new accounts? GM level players taking 60 plus games to reach their proper rank ruins so many more games it feels like climbing in general is artificially slowed down so people will play more even if they should have reached a higher rank many games ago alec responds with i tapped in our own gavin winters for this first part and this is what he had to say there haven't been any changes to these systems but there are edge cases like the example of i can't say this name shui i think it's shui isn't it gushui gushui <laughs> gushui <laughs> that was recently posted uh, on this subreddit where our systems don't perform in a way we'd like. Most players will still be placed appropriately as they transition from quick play to competitive play, but unfortunately, cases like this have always been possible. Explaining exactly how this happens would make it easy to reproduce, so you'll have to ex excuse me from not going into intricate detail here. 
For the second part of your question, we believe we made it slightly too difficult to climb at the highest ranks and are looking at making some adjustments soon. Will you ever make pick rates and win rates public, even a couple of weeks after the fact? I feel like it would do a lot to help people understand why changes are made. Is there a win rate range you want to keep all heroes to stay within? And Josh Noah responds with, there aren't any plans to currently to shift resources towards supporting something like that. <laughs> it's just an amazing PR comment to this. Like, what the hell? I mean, the thing is, they do have lessons. They literally get taught how to speak like this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a thing. Uh, anyway, sites like Overbuff don't have the complete picture, but the data there for win rates and such is generally fairly close. Now, this is a frigging bombshell of a statement because for the first time, Somebody at Blizzard has actually said Overbuff is accurate. All these years, we've assumed Overbuff isn't that accurate because you need to link your account to Overbuff. Like you, Overbuff just doesn't take the data from all of the games being played. It only takes it from the accounts that are linked. So you get like a very, you know, narrow view. But it looks like, even though it might be narrow, it actually can be extrapolated out. And it is fairly close to what the devs are seeing with their full-blown internal stats. That is a, well, it's a huge admission. There is some argument against being too transparent with those stats in that it can create a bit of a feedback loop where you might see player behavior driven by what appears to be the meta in the stats. But that kind of happens already with just the general discussion and sentiment around heroes without stats as well. So yeah, literally a pointless comment. But anyway, our target range for hero viability by win rate is between 45 and 55% unmirrored win rate at master's rank and above. Those individual win rates can often fluctuate by 2 to 3% by day. Mostly, because heroes tend to have a wider range of win rates per map, and we're looking at the global average of those, but also individual player performance isn't consistent. Lower pick rate heroes fluctuate more, and there is less confidence in their win rate being indicative of actual strength. Extremely high pick rate heroes have a similar problem when looking at unmirrored stats. In the end, Oh, yeah, sorry, I thought I read something different there. In the end, stats require interpretation to understand their context, and that is why they're not the only basis for balance changes, but are useful tool to measure the impact of changes patch over patch. And yet, you know, again, years and years and years have gone by. We've heard this, the balance triangle, the look at community reaction, look at what the devs think, look at the stats, balance them out, make a change. That's basically what they do. Um, so, yeah. But again, we've got a bit more data there on the win rates, but I think that's been made public before. Um, and if it hasn't, then I'm pretty sure it has. I'm pretty sure I've seen stats. Around, around win rates and how they're trying to balance heroes. Uh, obviously, this is impossible. That's the thing you've got to remember, guys. They literally cannot balance all of the heroes, so this will be balanced. Like, it's, it is impossible. You buff one hero, and it's going to inadvertently, in some way, buff another hero or even nerf another hero. A lot of things basically can't be predicted. What is Hanzo's new job? Is he supposed to take over Farah's place as the new go-to permanently pocketed hero? To explain more in depth, Hanzo used to be a sniper, but the recent changes caused most heroes to require one extra shot to eliminate a target. Considering Hanzo is the slowest shooting primary fire focused DPS, he was impacted the most, making him the only primary fire focused DPS who relies on cooldowns to finish off targets due to the very long time to kill, assuming full charging the arrows to be able to hit targets past melee range. Three body shots equals 2.5 seconds time to kill, 3.25 seconds if bow is not preloaded or best case scenario one headshot plus one body shot equals 1.2 seconds time to kill two seconds if the bow was not preloaded compared to for example cassidy four body shots 1.5 seconds time to kill or best case scenario two headshots equals 0.5 seconds time to kill hanzo's only advantage here is that he deals full damage past 35 meters but trying to hit someone two to three times in a row, even at 35 meters, is next to impossible, considering physical cover, plus long time to kill, and projectile travel time. At the same time, Mercy Pocketed Hanzo can still one shot, with the added benefit of now having two times bigger arrow hitbox and buffed storm arrows. Josh No responds, Hanzo is still an effective mid-range burst damage hero, even without the one-shot kills. Post season 9, with the projectile size and changes, actually saw an increase in Hanzo's performance on the stat side. I do hear you on the loss of how good the one shot kills feel, but an overarching goal of season 9 was to reduce a lot of the burst damage frustrations for players on the receiving end of it. Armor changes in season 10 have also been a benefit to his damage. Still, very early, but we've been experimenting with adjusting health pools for some of the more evasive or high damage heroes, which would also put them back into the range of lethal Hanzo headshots 
and some other hero combos at 225 HP. But while it would bring some interesting texture to hero interactions, overall, there is also a bunch of other problems to solve if we were to go through with it. Yeah, big Hanzo update there. And I think, to be honest, we could talk about Hanzo forever and ever and ever. On the one side of the coin, nobody likes being killed by a Hanzo log from across the map, which is still possible if he's got a damage boost from Mercy. But right now, if he doesn't, then it's not, and he feels kind of bad. But if the devs give him that power back when he's not <laughs> damage boosted by Mercy, we go back to the old Hanzo, and it feels kind of bad. So I don't know what they're doing with Hanzo, to be honest. In a lot of ways, Hanzo really does feel like a forgotten hero of Overwatch. A month later, and considering he's displayed proudly on the Twitter post for the AMA, I got my question. How have you guys felt about the past reworks on Roadhog and the new one, Wrecking Ball? Like, what are the goals were exactly? Your personal thoughts, the community responses, and what you want to fine-tune with them post-rework. Those things I think most people would be interested in, how you guys felt now that it's been a bit. And Alex says, For the most part, we're relatively happy with the new bases. Both have been given, but there is still some fine-tuning to be done. I'll start with Wrecking Ball. Our goals were to give him more flexibility with his movement and engage options, heighten the benefits he gives to his team, and give him some quality of life updates. I think our changes all attempted to address those goals, but one I think we can hit harder in the future is heightening the benefits he gives to his team. Oh dear. We were a little conservative with the adaptive shields change. Overhealth is hyper scary in coordinated environments, so perhaps there's room for that to be more pronounced through tuning and actual feedback received in games, working on some updates there. Overall though, Wrecking Ball is doing much better after his recent updates and we believe we have a great base to work with going forward. So the problem here with Wrecking Ball is the adaptive shield change to allow Wrecking Ball to give allies around him shields and gives them overhealth. Uh, I don't think that's, like that just doesn't feel like the direction to take the hero in. And I don't think anyone who plays Wrecking Ball even thinks that's a good idea. So this is a big issue. I mean, if you do, let me know in the comments below. But I just think this is a totally wrong direction to take the hero in. And I don't know, I don't really know what they're going for here. Like, they want him to be an independent dive tank, which is what Wrecking Ball is by his very nature. But on the other hand, they want to allow him to give shields to his allies. Uh, it's a bit strange. So moving on to Roadhog. Now, by the time this video is live, it, there is potential that this patch is actually out and we know the full details. But this is what they said uh before the patch went out, I guess. For Roadhog, aside from the conversations about his current survivability, we plan to hit that soon. There are some for us to look at concerning the frequency of his combo. For example, his pig pen begins to go on cooldown when you throw it, so you can pre-place once it gets destroyed, and then Roadhog already has it ready again, even though the enemy may think there's a window where Hook is less deadly. That's one discussion we've had recently. Still some work here for us to do in terms of value and pig pen brings outside of the combo as well, and how we make those windows of combo potential less frequent. And carrying on with the Roadhog theme, another question. Are there any nerfs being discussed for Hog, specifically survivability, times where multiple people are shooting a Hog and he just walks away while using his breather? Simply gaining more health than losing health makes the damage you're doing to him feel pointless and is very unfun to play against, especially now that headshots do less damage to him. And Alex says, yeah, we plan on nerfing his survivability very soon. We are touch and take a breather, and whole hog in an upcoming patch, hoping that can go live tomorrow. So yeah, I mean, essentially, they're just going to make both of them worse, aren't they? They're going to make whole hog do less damage, maybe have less duration, and take a breather again is going to have less duration probably, and just do less overall healing. Hello, with the major tank changes, e.g. armor changes, knockback changes, headshot change, and individual balance changes that released last week, I am very curious, have there been any noticeable immediate shifts in the win rates and pick rates among tanks? Has there been any collateral shifts within the DPS and support role because of the recent tank changes? I know that, for instance, after the recent armor change, some heroes have become weaker against armored tanks, i.e. Tracer and Reaper, while others have become significantly stronger, Cass and Hanzo. I'm interested in knowing how the team's behind the scenes statistics have measured lately as a result of the recent tank changes. That is, if it is possible for you guys to share it, if not understandable. And Alex says, some of this is related to meta happenings or balance changes, but also related to armor changes, headshot reduction for tanks. From what we can see, the biggest winners in terms of their performance delta of the patch are Anna, Junkrat, Farah, Roadhog, Sigma, Wrecking Ball, and Zarya. Many heroes have stayed relatively similar with a handful uh, saw a decrease in performance, Bastion, Diva, Malga, Arissa, and Reaper. So I think I kind of want to focus on Sigma here. So Sigma is an incredibly strong tank in the game right now. And you've got to remember, the last patch, they basically allowed you to use uh, Gravitic Flux without line of sight. So it means you can just Gravitic Flux anyone if they're in 
the area of the ultimate. But it just doesn't care about walls anymore or anything that blocks line of sight. So it's very easy to hit. It was a pointless, pointless power increase for the hero that really didn't need it. It was a buff. It was almost like going back to the Sojin buff back in January. They buffed Sojin when Sojin was incredibly powerful. Like, what was the point of the buff? It made no sense. It almost feels like they've done that with Sigma. But yeah, Sigma is definitely a winner of the patch. Um, but like I said, I wouldn't be surprised to see changes coming to that recent change very soon. Uh, and also Anna, she just wins all the time. <laughs> Anna's amazing. Literally, the, the greatest thing about Overwatch is the first hero they added to the game after they launched is the best hero in the game they've ever added to the game. It's amazing. Okay, I'll try and ask some general questions. Feel free to choose what to answer. In February, I noticed that you had received great feedback on the maps after the first hacked mode. But I was wondering when those ideas would be implemented, especially for flashpoints. Personally, I liked Clash more, but I wanted to know what kind of results you received that require modification, in your opinion, or if you have noticed any optimal results to maintain or imitate for other game modes. And Alex says, these fall outside of hero design, but I can talk briefly about the first two questions. I think you are re referencing the speed boosts that would potentially come to Flashpoint. It took us some time to get these in a good place, but they have been promising in playtests and are on track for a later season. It's important to us that when we add elements like that to a mode, that not only brings quality gameplay, but also is communicated well through sound and visual effects. Feel good here now. We got a lot of great feedback, uh, but there are some things the team wished we did better with Clash Preview. Firstly, it should have showed up more in quick play, so you all got more reps on it and you can get a better feel for the flow of the game mode. Secondly, we don't think it was best suited for open queue in arcade. If we do something like this again, we'll clean that up. With the feedback we received, we'll be investigating how to make the final point more appealing to capture for the attacking team. Many games could result in attacking team not actually wanting to push onto the last point because it wasn't worth the reward, harder to capture, give up a lot of positioning if you lose. Plenty of iteration happening here now to address that particular issue. So I guess like on the face of it, it was absolutely insane that this was just a, it was just a, it was an open queue mode in arcade. It made no sense. If you want to get actual feedback, you need roll queue structured teams. You cannot just go, well, let's just play five tanks. Off you go. It doesn't make any sense. It was stupid. But I guess what they were trying to do is balance getting actual feedback with just trying to give everybody the chance to play their hero on the new maps and well, the new map and the new game mode. So, yeah, I don't know, but a bit of an odd one. If I was in charge, I'd be like, no, this isn't going in open queue. We're going to have just a card and it's just roll queue and it's just this mode and you can just play it as much as you like. And also, I would have definitely increased the amount it showed up in quick play, um, but they did highlight that as an issue. Hi there. I think one of the most obvious questions people here will have is what are the plans to balance out Roadhog? With the mid-season tank adjustments, I'm sure the general sentiment is that Hog is an outlier for survivability and damage amongst the tanks, especially since Orissa isn't there to keep him in check now. The headshot damage reduction and his soft rework from before means his survivability is through the roof and his damage is as high as ever. What are the plans to rein him back in? I will also personally say I don't think the solution is to buff Orissa, rather nerf Hog to keep him in line. Aside from Hog, I think the tank balance is pretty great right now otherwise. Also, is there going to be something done about the overbearing passiveness of heroes like Life Weaver that will simultaneously not interact with the enemy team at all while also not providing any offensive utility for his own team? I think for all of the nine players in the lobby, it's a pretty miserable experience to have a life weaver. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Alex says, answer the Rodog question a different thing, but yeah, changes the comment. But then he goes on to life weaver and he says, for life weaver, one of the discussions we're having right now, actually this week, and have been having for a while, is around the friction that comes between switching between his healing and damage. Giving him more flexibility here would be a great boon to his capability within team fights. Additionally, with experimenting a lot with his petal platform, Personally, I would love for that to be more attractive, would be a more attractive area to stand on as a teammate, whether that be through a buff the platform gives you or something else. There's a lot of learned behavior to work through as allies hop on and off quite often. So this may possibly be they add a small heal over time effect to the pedal platform to make people get on it. They could also make it a bit bigger, I suppose, or make it available more often because if it is a supplementary heal, mm, that might be quite good. Or when Life Weaver uses it himself, it's healing him and he goes up and then he does damage, you know, when he's hovering in the air with it. So, yeah, I don't know. But interesting, they are talking about Life Weaver. And again, going back to me waxing lyrical about Anna being an incredible hero added to the game and she was the first hero. Life Weaver, one of the more modern heroes, has just been totally forgettable. So I believe this Mercy question is from Ski SD. Uh, obviously a great content creator. Mercy main, loads of awesome Mercy videos. Uh, but let's just break this down. Hey, I have two Mercy questions. 
is the team looking at Mercy at all for any of its changes slash small buffs? Two, what is Mercy's pick weight and, and rent win rate now compared to Season 3? Back in mid-Season 9, the DPS passive was reduced and a dev blog stated Mercy wouldn't see changes as she should be more reliable moving forward. With the reduction, that nerf was reverted and Mercy stayed the same. The community has been ranking Mercy as a D-tier support for a few seasons now and she's in this weird spot where people don't like playing against her, with her or as her. <laughs> And I and many and sorry, I and many others still enjoy her most out of all the other heroes, but she doesn't play nearly as fun as she used to after the changes that have been made to her, mainly nerfs, and the game over the last year, thanks. And Alex says, okay, one. I think we're more than happy with the 20% DPS passive world uh, than the 15%. It cuts through a lot better, helps mitigate the healing more effectively. So Mercy is more worth a look when that world is permanent. There are some questions of how far we can push her movement and I know that is one of the most requested changes. At number two, Mercy is a top pick three out of four support, uh, top pick three quarters support, three out of four, whatever, support and even higher on console until you hit GM top 500. Her performance follows a similar trend where she's in the top grouping for most ranks and remains above average at the highest ranks. Doesn't mean that she won't receive changes, but that's where she's at currently. Mm. So this to me reads like we're not changing anything with Mercy. We may possibly do something to her movement in the future, but that's it. So I don't know. Mercy mains out there. Is this is this good news? I'm going to guess it's not. And actually, it's quite bad. Ugh. So this question is about counter swapping. I'm specifically talking about the counter swapping meta and unhealthy tank designs being allowed to exist like tank busters and unkillable tanks, Roadhog, Malga and Orissa. I'm specifically uh, sorry. Are we confident? That making tanks able to do almost everything is the right thing to do. Are we confident that we can make tank fun again for the majority of the player base without straight buffs? The headshot reduction and knockback reduction changes are especially interesting to me because I really don't think that simple number changes will fix how tanks feel and play. I don't want to counter swap. I don't want to face unkillable and easy to play tanks. I don't want to tank busters. I really love this game, but it currently feels like if we're going in the wrong direction, or like we are going in the wrong direction, while ignoring the biggest problems. Get ready for this answer, because this is uh, quite interesting. At its core, Overwatch is a game designed around being able to swap heroes to gain a tactical advantage or help solve a challenge you might be encountering. This contributes to keeping the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay experience dynamic, drives hero diversity, and offers a wider range of both strategic gameplay and skill expression in learning when, where, how to play multiple heroes. There is a question of how much of an advantage is too much compared to the cost of switching. Ideally, we want counters to be clear and understandable, but soft enough that it's possible to outplay a disadvantaged matchup. It's a team game though, and 1v1 matchups are not the highest priority when assessing the heroes. Tanks do feel this at the moment, at the most, with only one of them per team in 5v5 role queue. But all roles do experience the pressure to counter and be countered to an extent. We're striving to find a balance between swapping heroes every death which certainly feels too often, and rarely swapping heroes or getting trapped in mirror matches every game, which quickly leads to fatigue. We've seen a lot of improvements here compared to earlier seasons, but it could always be better. Unhealthy and unpopular designs are not necessarily the same thing. When designing heroes, we aim to provide a wide range of playstyles, mechanics and aesthetics for players to enjoy. It's okay if they don't all resonate with everyone broadly, but do our best to make the game as fun as it can be for a wide audience which is funny isn't it because if you play hell divers their, their their motto is a game for everyone it's a game for no one <laughs> anyway blizzard design heroes for everybody uh, all right and every play style anyway yeah like the, the funny thing here is you, i've just got to throw it out a 6v6 <laughs> i know this keeps going on and i look at my recent videos in overwatch and the comments are just 6v6 in the comments below and i'm like oh no but it's interesting isn't it because uh tank i mean we said this didn't we i, I mean shit it's like two years ago now we said this and we were like you go one tank the tank is going to be the most high pressure role because it will be the most susceptible to being countered by the enemy tank if you play i don't know a winston into a roadhog you just lose right that's the end of it you've lost so you've got to change but what happens if you want to play winston mm. but actually if you had two tanks you still could maybe play your winston if your other tank does something to help you Maybe plays a diva and gives you a nice defense matrix when you get hooked so you don't die. Yeah, that's what 6v6 brings to the game, doesn't it? It makes it arguably 
easier to balance. Now, obviously, the issue Overwatch had with tanks was you had double shields. We had like all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Uh, but yeah, it's still a sad world, isn't it, really, that they didn't take the time to really try and balance 6v6. But hey, it's a 5v5 world we're living in. <laughs> you guys, let me know in the comments below what you think about all of this. Like I said, it's been a pretty long video, so I'm not going to ramble too much at the end of this. Uh, hopefully, you've enjoyed the gameplay in the background of the video. Um, obviously, I've been playing a bit of Sigma. Uh, a bit of Winston as well. I do love Winston. Um, I Personally, I've found Tank to be kind of okay. But I must admit, I'm more of a quick play warrior these days than I am grinding comp game after comp game. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think, guys, in the comments below. And uh, as ever, thanks for watching. Do like the video if you did like it. And I'll catch you lovely lot on the next one. See you soon.